Praise the Lord, saints. We are celebrating, commemorating, and exuberant about another Mother's Day. Amen. Our text scripture is Psalms 128, verses 1 through 3. And I'm just mindful of uh, the importance, significance of mothers. Um, Throughout time, they're already always remembered. We got songs. I always love my mama. She's my favorite girl. Um, ballads, paintings, uh, all sorts of things relating to mothers and their importance. So we're just going to um, look through some scriptures today and look at some of the women in the Bible and just examine how it's such a great privilege and honor uh, to be a mother, uh, whether it's biological, spiritual, emotional, as well as uh, the way in which we should applaud mothers for the incredible role of servitude that they've had over people, both their own children as well as others. Let's look at Psalms 128, verses 1 to 3. A song of degrees. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Praise God. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise. For the opportunity once again to celebrate uh, the role of mothers in our lives. None of us would be here if it had not been for our mothers. Mm -hmm. We praise you, Father, that whether it's from the early stages of having our diapers changed to, as they say, stroking that boo-boo when the child falls and cries, uh, when they have various pains, whether they're physical or emotional, uh, just the nurturing love and power that's associated with mothers we celebrate today. So we thank you, Father, for this, and we give you the praise, honor, and glory for the extraordinary women in the Bible that we're going to look at today and see how that relates to uh, the wonderful women that still are in our daily lives. We thank you, Father, for this. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So once again, celebrating Mother's Day. And the first North American Mother's Day was conceptualized with Julia Ward Howe's Mother's Day proclamation in 1870. So this has gone on for a while. Despite having penned the Battle Hymn of the Republic 12 years earlier, one of our greatest and most patriotic songs, how have become so distraught by the death and carnage of the Civil War that she called on mothers on both sides of the war to come together and protest what she saw as the futility of their sons killing each other. 150 years later, as you were passing now, we are still commemorating the greatest of servants, the ones who unselfishly give of themselves to their children. Once again, whether it's biological, emotional, or spiritual, and time and time and again, they serve, amen, those who are under their loving oversight with no expectation of anything in return. <laughs> and the love of a mother is so unique that once again, you can fall and they'll clean up that wound give you a few kisses and everything's right. A mother will also hit you upside your head when you get older if you're not acting right. But regardless of what form of mother you're receiving, it is still intended to guide you to wholeness, to being an asset to society, and especially if they're Christian mothers, to have a reverence and fear of God. Abraham Lincoln once declared, no man is poor who has had a godly mother. Wow, listen to that. No man is poor 
who has had a godly mother. In other words, there's a lot of wealth that is produced by the relationship between a mother and her children, regardless of their material wealth. If you've had a godly mother, quite frankly, you've had one of the greatest treasures that can ever be bestowed upon somebody. And he noted that quite eloquently. There's a Spanish proverb that states, an ounce of mother is worth a ton of priests. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm laughing. laughs> Once again, an ounce of mother is worth a ton of priest. In terms of effectively grooming a child to have godly attributes. And that's not taking away from a priest, you know, or a pastor, a Bible study teacher, a, a youth minister. No, it's not taken away from that, but they're only with the children once in a while. It is the day-to-day -day interaction with a mother that will reinforce anything that a priest, pastor, youth minister will impart into the children. It is the mother, and, you know, there's times that something can happen with a child that the priest or the pastor may not be aware of it. And there's times where the child could be at a distance away from the mother, but mother in the spirit, just like Paul sensed or prayed and received revelation about things regarding the churches that he founded. And he would send letters sometimes to discipline them. You might be able to hide from most men and women. You might be able to hide from you know, organizations and uh, different governmental bodies, but you cannot hide from the all-seeing eye of God and sometimes the super-seeing eye of the mother. <laughs> and that's why you get that call. All right, what you up to? What are you doing? What's going on? That looks right, but I know something ain't right. That's that. <laughs> we are in the likeness of God who is all-seeing. So mothers on a smaller scale get a mini all-seeing eye. They can see some stuff behind the scenes that's not evident on the surface. Oh, boy. So it is a privilege, a great privilege, for women to bear, adopt, or serve in a motherhood role. And today we celebrate that, especially as people are going more and more away from God. You know, godly mothers, women who are armed and equipped with the word of God, who have perfected the principles of God in themselves and now are you know, serving as beacons of light and love into the lives of other people. Uh, they are so priceless today. So before we look at some examples of motherhood, let's just, just examine a couple of verses illustrating their importance, amen? Um, Psalms 144, 11 through 15. Once again, Psalms 144, 11 through 15. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaks vanity. And their right hand is a right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones, polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and tens thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yes, happy is that people whose God is their Lord. And we see here that we need to be rid and delivered from the hand of strange children who speak improper or profane or godless things. And we see that their right hand, instead of being a right hand of blessing, instead it's one who, that produces falsehood and trouble. And what is truly desired is that the young men will grow up, you know, like blossoming trees that are fruitful, that are doing things that are beneficial, not only for themselves, but for future, future generations, and that the women, amen, will grow up, you know, 
polished as if they were uh, a glorious palace, you know, just, you know, visible as prominent and splendid in the eyes of others. This is what the intent is supposed to be. But if you don't have mothers to impart that godliness in them, a lot of times people go wayward. And we see exactly what it says in the beginning. Strange children, they are foreign to God. They are foreign to the principles of God. They don't walk in those things. They don't think according to God. They're out producing mischief as opposed to producing things that, once again, are beneficial for their own lives as well as for the lives of those who they interact with. This is what the folly may be or the corruption that can be produced when you don't have a godly mother to steer them in the right direction. And there are times where, let's face it, um, especially um, children get to their teenage years and they just want to get a taste of adult life. I'm tired of mommy and daddy telling me what to do, so I'm going to go try this and do that. And I know it's inappropriate, but one of the things that they always have is that understanding in their heart of hearts that no matter what I may do, no matter how much other people may reject me, I can always come back to mama. Mm -hmm. And mama might discipline me. Once again, she might mm -hmm. put that foot somewhere. <laughs> she might give you a stern talking to. <laughs> I remember seeing a video one time where <laughs> a young man mouthed off to his mother and he's about halfway down the street. She took off a sandal, threw that thing like a boomerang and hit him dead center in the back of his head. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's that mother anointed. <laughs> but they will steer you back in the right direction before you go too far and into destruction. This is the value of a mother. We see here that, you know, there will be no breaking in, you know, no complaining and dysfunction, and chaos in the streets. And the end result is that people are happy and blessed when their children, their offspring, or the, the children that they interact with and serve in a mentorship role. Um, as they steer them into righteousness, it produces happiness and peace in the lives of all those that they in interact with. I'm not gonna say that in every situation that you see a wayward child that they're a product of bad mothering. No, sometimes you, know, you get to the age where you gotta make an account for yourself. But you know, I have seen times over the years where you just interact with, with, with children and young adults. And you're like, man, wow, that, that's a, that kid is just such a blessing. That young man or young, young woman, oh, man, what was instilled in them was such, so precious. Oh, they must have had, you know, great parenting. You know, a lot of credit goes back uh, to mother and, of course, father as well. But today we're celebrating mothers. So a lot of this is instilled from birth from the mother. They always have an open ear to share things with their mother. And there's times even when they might not be comfortable with their own biological mother, but people have somebody in their life that serves in that mothering role. Amen. That's an honorable and blessed thing as well. Let's look at another passage of scripture. Psalms 127.3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. Wow. Children are a heritage of the Lord. Something that is imparted from him. Amen. And it says the fruit of the womb is his reward. Amen. You know, we plant seeds into the ground with the expectation that if I put down apples, I'll get apple trees. And then later on. Apples as a result of that. If I plant oranges, the same thing. Tomatoes, grapes, you name it. You know, you plant a certain type of seed, you have an expectation that the offspring or the byproduct of that will be something of the same kind. We see here that children are a heritage of the Lord. So there should be an expectation that just as you plant any other kind of seed, there's an expectation that you're going to produce something of the same kind. And if children are God's blessing, the end result of those children should be a future blessing. And that's why the fruit of the womb, if the principles of God are imparted into that child, just as an apple seed will produce 
a tree and then later multiple trees and fruit to eat, a godly mother instilling the righteousness of God into that child not only produces a godly plant or an adult, but then she can have the expectation that the heritage of her womb producing that fruit will produce generations of godly seed that not only a blessing to her, but also a reward or a blessing unto the kingdom of God itself. Amen. So what women are doing in their children, yes, they want children to be an asset to society. They want children to honor them in their old age and to produce blessed grandchildren that are loving and kind and have character. But they should also realize that as they're imparting that into their children to see the end result of the blessings and love of, they put into those children coming back to them, that they're also putting that harvest out there for God as well. And it's a reward. It's a blessing unto his kingdom. Amen. So God is, in a sense, getting return on his investment of entrusting the woman to be able to mother those children. All right, let's look at some mothers. As I said, it's a selfless life often. Sacrificial. Go look at some mothers that gave their children to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 and 1 through 10. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the river side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women? that she may nurse the child for thee. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. <laughs> and the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. Wow. A blessed, godly woman seeing the horrors of what is being perpetrated upon her, her people. It's inspired. I'm sure God inspired her. You know, of all things, common sense, why would you put a child in a body of water? You know, the risk of drowning is so extreme, but yet she was led to do that. And as she did that, you know, it floats down. It's discovered by uh, Pharaoh's daughter and her maids. And then the crazy thing is when they said, let's get somebody to nurse her. Oh, there happens to be a woman who is able to do that. <laughs> and it turns out to be his actual mother, man. Look how the blessings of God flow when you have a, a selfless and giving, a sacrificial heart. You're willing to do whatever is necessary to protect your children, even what common sense might say would be danger, and a willingness to, if necessary, you know, the dictates were to expose and to kill those children. She's like, not so with mine. I'm going to do what's necessary. I'll hide them for a few months, and when it gets to the point where I can't do that any longer, then... You know, this might be crazy, but I'll do something else because I must do whatever is necessary, whatever it takes to save my child. And the blessing of God flowed in such a way that she not only gets to nurse her child again when she thought I might not ever see him again, 
but she's getting paid for it. She's getting wages. <laughs> God has a way of turning things around. And the great thing is that he was named Moses because he was drawn out of the water. Uh, Pharaoh was trying to kill off all the Hebrew uh, boys. And then the very thing that was supposed to exterminate him, God uses that very thing to punish all of Egypt. Amen. You try to drown my children. Those are my children. They were my heritage. You tried to drown them. Now I'm going to drown you and your army. God has a way of getting back. Yes, Amen. Amen. So this is what happened in the life of Moses because of the giving, a sacrificial attitude that his mother had. And the crazy thing, too, is that, you know, she... He is in the palace. He's living as a, you know, a prince of the kingdom, but yet he still has a heart for his people. Amen. And look how God turned that situation around. But it's because of the sacrificial and protective heart of the mother. We definitely need that type of mindset in this day and age. And we appreciate and thankful for the mothers who are willing to make sacrifices to do whatever it takes at all costs to ensure the safety of their children. And sometimes as it relates to society or nature or whatever, you know, principles surround a situation, it might seem crazy to do something um, that is necessary to save your life. But if God is leading you, you need to abide by what God is saying. You know, once again, she puts him out into a body of water, but God Amen. Steps in and ensures the safety of that child based upon her sacrificial attitude and the attitude that she had to save her child at all costs. And God, you know, sometimes, you know, children this day and age might, you know, sometimes venture out to a situation that might be dangerous or they might be surrounded by circumstances, whether it's governmental or environmental, whatever it may be, that because of the heart of a godly woman, God will intervene and protect them from all sorts of danger. But that initial aspect, having a godly heart as a mother, is one of the key things to ensure this. Let's go up and look at another godly woman. Uh, 1 Samuel 1, 9-11. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Here we had Hannah, a woman who wanted a child, and even speaking to her husband, he said, am I not worth more than a bunch of sons? You know, I bless you, I do this, I do that. But one good thing, about that, so he saw you know, the desire in his wife and said that he had vowed a vow. And he later on honored this. Um, and then she vowed a vow as well, amen, and said, if you will give me this child, I know I'm barren, but Lord, to me, this is an affliction. If you will bless me and give me a son, then I will dedicate him unto you all the days of his life. And that's exactly what she did. She honored her vow. God blessed her. And he became one of the greatest of prophets. Amen. The prophet Samuel, a man who spoke to kings, anointed kings. You know, one of the greatest men of God that's recorded in the Bible. But this was in uh, a response to a woman who desperately wanted a child, but said, I don't want this child just for myself and my family. 
No, if you give me this man child, I will then return him unto you and will dedicate him to your service all the days of his life. So God honored her. Amen. And she honored God by doing what she had promised. The promises that mothers make regarding their children to God. You know, we see, we see she vowed a vow and she honored that vow. And because of that, God blessed her with the desires of her heart. It's so crucial that mothers, as they are, you know, presenting their children before the Lord or having children that, you know, they have that mindset that, Lord, I know you've blessed me with this child, but I dedicate this child unto you, to your service. You do with them whatever you will. You know, as much as I might want for them to do this or have that career or go to the school or play this sport or whatever it may be, no matter what I desire, Lord, your desires are above mine. So uh, I just dedicate this child unto you and your leadership that they can become whatever you envision. And because she had that type of heart, amen, God honored her request. And once again, the byproduct was one of the greatest prophets, amen, that the world has ever seen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, let's go over to another one. Woo. Boy, is this mother important. Luke 1, 26 through 38. Luke 1, 26 through 38. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How should this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Wow, we see two wonderful and godly women who produce children via the intervention and miracle and power of God. Elizabeth was in old age and barren, and she was blessed with one of the greatest men and prophets of all time, John the Baptist. And then we see here Mary, who has not even been with a man physically. She's engaged, but she has not um, been married yet, and she gets the announcement. Um, and the, the great thing about the announcement is that we see that the Lord was already examining her character. And the angel, when he came to her, said, the Lord is with thee. You know, the Lord is, is, is present. The Lord has been overseeing you. The Lord knows your character. And because of the greatness of your love to him, for him, and the, the, the honor that is associated with your character, your, your godliness, God has chosen you for this you know, seemingly impossible task for a woman to have child without, you know, being with a man, you know, but we see here that, you know, she's like, well, I, I can't quite understand it at first, but whatever you want to do, Lord, I'm here, I'm available. And the end result 
is that the greatest man of all time was birthed out of situation. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And this came from the character. And that shows us, though, that um, material things, not saying that they're evil, but God cares more about the heart of that woman. And quite frankly, he cares a lot of times, even before she's even thinking, like, I'm about to be pregnant and give birth. God is observing the character of people. And he's looking for people who will have those characteristics that he could use. Amen. Um, in that case, the stakes were so high that mankind itself was at stake. And he was looking. And, and, you know, all the women on that planet, he saw that this is the one who has the perfect character for what I need to produce. Wow. Um, you never know. Uh, won't be a savior. We can guarantee that. But you never know who God may be examining for something that he wants to present or to provide to this world. And he may use a particular woman to be the one who will bear that child or serve in a multi uh, motherhood role. You just never know. And that's why um, walking with godliness, amen, ahead of something being necessary is so critical. You know, did she know that she was going to be, you know, bringing forth the Savior of the world? No. Was she even thinking about that? I'm sure she was thinking about marriage and children at some point. She was engaged. So, yeah, my nuptials are on the horizon. I'm sure we'll have children at some point, or I hope to. But she didn't know she was going to be giving birth to the Savior of the world. <laughs> but she had the character for God to use her. Character is above everything in the heart and in the life of the mother. And just having that willingness to do whatever God asked of you, even if it seems to be strange or impossible. You know, she's just like, you know, modern day lingo. She's probably like, my mind is blown, but okay, whatever you say, Lord, I'll do it. <laughs> do we have mothers in this day and age that are willing to do that as well? So we've looked at mothers who gave their children to God. Let's look at an example of motherly guidance. Motherly guidance. And we'll see that in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Ruth 1, 14 through 18. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is going back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thou people shall be my people, and thy God my God. She was not, Naomi was not Ruth's biological mother. Boy, was she her spiritual and emotional mother. I mean, you know, she's basically saying, hey, it's the time for us to separate. I'm going back to my people, return to your people. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, you may want to, you know, get remarried and, and have sons. So I have nothing else to offer you. So I love the two of you. We're crying as we're hugging and everything, but it's time for us to go our separate ways. And Orpa you know, wept, hugged, and went her separate way back to her people. But Ruth was like, I ain't going nowhere. You know, no matter where you go, I'm willing to go. You know, no matter what people you're with, if they're your people, they're my people. And as it, as it relates to worship, you know, your God will be my God. You know, I see so much in you. You've, you've instilled and nurtured me so well that, I cannot separate myself from you, so I want to remain under, you know, the shadow of your wings the rest of my life, and, you know, whatever it takes, you know, I am willing to do that. You know, I just refuse, based upon the things that you've done in me, 
and have you supported me and loved and nurtured me, I am not going to separate myself from you. She even said, I, I plead with you, do not force me to leave you. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. So just look at the motherly guidance and oversight and nurturing that she instilled um, in Ruth. And we know as we read further on that Ruth was blessed. Amen. But um, it was the relationship that was instilled in her. It was the things that she saw that she said that, hey, you know, I, I'm not going to separate myself from you and never lay eyes on you again. You're too important to me. And the things that you have to offer, I still treasure them, but I want them to continue. This is the role of the motherhood that you could have for somebody, even if they're not your, your biological offspring. And that is so critical in this day and age. So many um, hurting uh, youth and uh, young adults, so many confused people, so much dysfunction and chaos. Um, so many people that could be mothered who are motherless. And once again, we need to get beyond the biological. If God has placed you in a situation where you can serve in that role, it is just as important and significant as coming out of that woman's womb and being raised from, you know, a baby all the way up to adulthood. If you have the type of situation where you can impart the love of God and that mothering nature into the life of somebody else who needs that. I mean, so many people have gone astray because they did not feel uh, feel that they were properly nurtured, that nobody cares about them. You know, my life is empty because nobody loves me. You can literally be the person who will mend that wound and close that hole and turn the life around. Amen. And as we see here, Ruth said, your God will be my God. You can turn it around that somebody who have may, may have never known God now lives for God because of what you imparted in them. And it starts with that motherly love. You know, it's so easy sometimes people think to just thump them over the head with the Bible. No. Give them the love of God. That'll open up their mind to receive the love of Christ. Give them that first. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go to, uh, we're going to look at examples of motherly protection. Motherly protection. And this one's definitely tremendous. First Kings three. And we're going to look at verses sixteen through twenty eight. First Kings three, sixteen through twenty eight. There came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I could, had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, 
for her bowels yearn upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. But the other said, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. <coughs> Excuse me. That's pretty extreme. Y'all can't settle <laughs> who the mother of that child is amicably. Let's just cut it in half. Doesn't really say much about the, the one woman. Yeah, yeah, split in two. But the one who was the true mother said, like, look, much as I love, I want to nurture my child. If the end result of your decision is to cut the child in half and give each one of us half of a dead child, go ahead and let her have the child. I love my child too much to allow it to die. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is something that he had no intention of doing, um, but uh, the wisdom of God in him enabled him to present a scenario that would expose who the true mother was versus the one who was lying. And as we see here, um, it happened, it played out exactly as he envisioned, and he was able to gain the insight into who the true mother was, even, even though he didn't know either one of them. So um, that was a blessing, but one of the things that really is critical in all this is that mothers will protect their children, just like we saw um, in the life of Moses. They will protect their child um, to the uttermost, no matter what the cost. And in this situation, as much as she loved that child and didn't want to lose it, she said, like, I'd rather lose my child and have him raised up by somebody else than to see him perish. And um, given the sort of things that are especially present in this day and age, uh, we need more mothers, you know, who have that willingness to do whatever sacrifices are necessary for their children. We see here that as much as she wanted to keep her child, it said literally her bowels yearned upon her son. I'll give him up if that's what it takes to keep him alive. Imagine how much it would have pained her to lose her child, but she's like, if that's what it takes for him to live, I'll deal with the heartbreak. You know, my heart will be broken. I'll be devastated, but I'll know my child is alive. Amen. She was willing to do that. But thank God that, you know, it was revealed that she was a true mother and she got to keep him. Um, what sacrifices are mothers willing to make? Good and godly mothers, amen, are willing to do similar things. Some, sometimes the decisions that they face might be heartbreaking, devastating. But if it's what is necessary to ensure the safety and especially the life of that child, good and godly mothers will do that. A thousand times over. Amen. They do it every time. Even if they themselves are devastated by the end results. They will do what it takes to ensure, you know, the safety of their children. Let's look at another one. Second Kings 11. 1 through 3. And when Athelia, the mother of As. Ahaziah saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah so that he was not slain. And he was hid with her in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. 
Praise the Lord. In this situation, it wasn't the mother, it was the aunt. Amen. Seeing, um, as they did often, and unfortunately, during that period of time, and uh, this is not something that just happened there, but other cultures, other countries, this happened that if a family rose to power, they would kill all the heirs. They would kill the, the king and queen and all their children so that, that the royal family would be totally eliminated. And now we start a new era with our people and our offspring. So the aunt here hid, you know, her nephew. And Jehoash was saved because of the love and the protection. So it's not just a mother sometimes that steps in to protect the child. You know, there are times where, you know, somebody that could be an aunt, a grandmother, we see that so often. You know, sometimes where mothers aren't caring for their children for whatever reason, could be incarceration, drug addiction, just wayward. They won't do what is necessary to ensure the safety and the nurturing of their children. So aunts, grandparents, you know, other people step in. Once again, as they get older, role models step in to um, just pour love into the, the heart and the life of that child. And it preserves them from situations where, you know, they may not be spared. Now, most of us typically won't deal with something that extreme, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, but uh, it just shows you the value that preserving and having uh, an attitude of motherly protection uh, just is such a blessing in the life of that individual, even when they're too young to realize it. And hopefully they get to the place of adulthood where they see what was imparted unto them and the sacrifices that were made. And they will honor that person as a mother. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, and especially when they're younger, the most important thing is not what I have to gain. Mothers will, you know, not even thinking of themselves, make sacrifices. You know, this aunt could have got herself killed by doing this. You did what? Bring him here and kill her with him. I mean, she risked her life. And, you know, yes, it was still biological, but the reality is she just had the heart of a mother for this young child. It's unjust. It's unthinkable what you're willing to do to this child. So I'm going to take the risk and, and hide him, amen, um, from what would happen. And I will not allow him to be a part of the massacring of the royal seed. I will not allow this to happen to this child. Uh, it just shows you just a loving and nurturing heart, and a heart that's willing to make sacrifices, and in this case, to take risk. She put her own life on the line, because if this had been exposed, she would have been next in line to get killed. But she was willing to do it anyway, because she had the heart, uh, the, the protective heart of a mother. Um, and that's so uh, so blessed. Uh, once again, certain attributes that emanate from God are invaluable. They're 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 priceless. And from generation to generation to generation, technology changes, science changes, all these different things change. But there's certain things that are universal. Gravity. We need that here on Earth. It's a principle that we need. Something goes up, it must get pulled down by gravity. We also need the love and nurturing of a mother. Praise the Lord. Something that will never, ever end. Let's look at an example of the love of a mother. You know, sometimes kids go a little wayward. <laughs> Let's look at Judges 13, 1 through 7. Judges 13, 1 through 7. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bore not. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold now, you are barren and bore not, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray you, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For see, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. 
For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not, not from where he was, neither told me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Wow. So this was actually the mother, if you haven't guessed, of Samson. Amen. And we see, I mean, there's times people take a Nazarite vow. Uh, once they're older, I've essentially taken one. No drink. So, um, but he actually was taking part of an oath to not have strong drink or any unclean thing eaten, even in the womb of his mother who took on that oath because of what God told her to do. And um, she was told that, hey, you were barren, but you're going to have a very special son who's going to be a deliverer. You're going to take an oath now that you won't drink anything, any strong drink, or eat any unclean thing, and you'll never put a razor to his hair. So even from his earliest moments here in the world, his mother took on the oath that God wanted for his life. She made sure it was honored. She instilled that within him. And unfortunately, he went a little wayward and got himself in trouble, got blinded. But the end result was that even though he was wayward, he still had instilled in himself a love and a devotion to God. And one of the final things he did, he's like, Lord, let me destroy you your enemies. And that's how he went out. <laughs> so he went out in a blaze of glory, serving God, um, even though he was wayward. And it just shows you that um, God will sometimes lead the mother to raise the child up a certain way. And even though it may seem like the child went off the beaten path, that child is sinning, that child is getting themselves into a mess, uh, they're, they're partaking of all these things that I never told them to do. He still had the principles of God embedded in his mind and, and his heart. And at his deepest, darkest moment, he basically saw it like, man, I've messed up. What did I do to myself? How have I dishonored my God? And God, I repent. I ask you to give me the strength to destroy the enemies of your kingdom it, with my final breath and that's what he ended up doing mm -hmm. so the principles and the heart and devotion to God was in there he may have gone astray but what his mother put in him amen was with him in his final moments and that's something that you know of course no mother wants to see their children um, make mistakes they definitely don't want to see their child die before they do um, or go down in a violent death but you know, she honored God in everything she did. She was thankful for going from being barren to now bearing a child. She honored the promise that she made before God in terms of how she would raise him up from birth, you know, to live a certain manner. And even his final moments, he was a servant of God. I mean, that's the best of the best. You know, most mothers aren't going to have children that live an entire life perfect but if they live the, the the overall aspects of their life submitted to God and serving him and once again if they're going to leave this earth at least let their mind be upon God that's one of the greatest things that a mother can instill in their child even if they went wayward he went wayward for a season but he came back home spiritually before his life ended and that was because of the sacrifices and the things that his mother impart it into him. And that's what we need mothers to do. Uh, we're going to close today with um, one verse. Amen. It's a, actually just literally one verse, but I think it sums it all up. Proverbs 22, 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he was is old, he will not 
depart from it. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's what we need to be done. And yes, we need two parents to be present, a father and mother. Today we are focusing on a mother. And one of the things that is a, a key role in mothers is training up children in the way that they should go. And if they're going off the beaten path, like I said, God has, you know, given them a certain sense, you know, like something's not right. What's going on with you? <laughs> and give a mom the, the, the ability that one minute they can once again stroke that boo-boo and the next go upside your head or give you, you know, a lecture that will put a college professor to, to shame. You know, a mother can do that. A mother can yell at you one minute and be in tears the next. But the mothers, amen, they always will impart love and nurturing and guidance and godliness if they are, you know, a mother that is serving God in spirit and truth. They will always do that, you know, training them up. And training them, you know, starts at the womb. Actually, you can say, yeah, actually, I said it right. It starts in the womb, you know, praying over that child while they're inside of you. Um, and then once they're here, training them up as they go from diaper up to having their own children. And if it's a, a non-biological role, motherhood is still there that you provide guidance and oversight, nurturing and support, um, prayerfulness, all these different things are aspects of mothers. Mm -hmm. And we once again celebrate those who are Christian and godly mothers today because uh, the world is getting harder, things are getting tougher, uh, things are getting more extreme, dysfunctional, and quite frankly, God, godless. So we need loving, godly mothers to impart his principles into them. And it starts with just the very nature that our godly mothers have. Mm -hmm. So we honor them today. We celebrate and give them a clap and a high five and a hallelujah and a salute. Um, cannot thank God enough for the mothers as we celebrate them today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you once again for the opportunity to partake of your word. And Lord, even as we are celebrating Mother's Day, we thank you, Lord, that all the attributes that a godly mother has emanate from you. And the same way you oversee us, you nourish, you provide for us, you heal us to deliver us, support us, uh, reprove us. Just all the different things that you do in us as our Heavenly Father. You've instilled those qualities into godly mothers. And we praise you, Father, that um, from the womb uh, to the grave or to adulthood, um, all the things that are in mothers are intended to guide them towards uh, godliness to be fruitful, to be assets to society, to uh, be blessings everywhere they go, to be people of character and intelligence, to be people who are um, giving and selfless the same way that their mothers are. We just thank you for all the qualities you've placed into them. And Lord, once again, whether it's biological, emotional, spiritual, all the different ways in which uh, people can be mothered. And once again, it could be a child or it could be an adult. There are so many adults who did not have um, a loving upbringing, but um, you can use godly women to be uh, mothers in their life. So we thank you, Father, for that. We do salute them today. We praise you for um, giving us a heart to honor them. We thank you, Lord, that you part your blessings, your peace, your healing, your nurturing, your prosperity whatever they need uh, poured out unto them and for those who may have lost children we ask you to comfort them today for those who uh, may have relationships that aren't um, the best right now we ask you to heal and reconcile them for those who um, need to um, are praying for the salvation and deliverance of the children we pray that you will pour that out today and if they have um, lost sight of you we ask you father to heal them and restore them unto you today. We thank you, Father, for this, and we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.